All right, so the next sort of building blocks that we'll need to take derivatives of more complicated functions are the derivatives of sine and cosine, okay? So let's just review sine and cosine a little bit because I, I don't think I've really even gone over it that much in this class yet. So recall that sine and cosine tell you basically the xy coordinates on your unit circle, right? So they're a way to convert from angles to numbers, right? So at angle theta, on the unit circle, right? If you remember the unit circle from trigonometry or pre-calculus, um, at an angle theta, let's say angle zero, the xy coordinate on that unit circle is the cosine sine value, right? So at x, sorry, at theta equals zero, cosine of zero is one, and sine of zero is zero, right? And then at angle pi over six, right, cosine of pi over six is root three over two, sine of pi over six is a half, right? So based on this unit circle, you can kind of pull out any angle and get the sine and the cosine value, right? And then another way to see this is, is if you graph these two, right? So here we have sine and cosine. So I think in blue, we have cosine of theta or cosine of x, just call it x. And on the right, in red, we have sine of x, right? So this is x and this is x. Okay, so right, at x equals zero, cosine of zero is one, right? So that corresponds to this angle here, right? Angle zero. And the cosine value is the first, the x coordinate, and the sine value is zero, the y coordinate, right? So if we look over here, at zero, cosine is one, at zero, sine of zero is zero, right? And then cosine is going to decrease from one down to zero at pi over two, right? So at angle pi over two, right? So when x is pi over two, that's here, cosine is now zero. <clears throat> but notice that sine was zero, right? So this is the y coordinate. And now the y coordinate has gone all the way up to one, its maximum, right? So sine at pi over two, is equal to one, right? That's its maximum, right? And then we keep going around the unit circle, right? So now we're going down, right? So this angle is still increasing, right? So X is still going up our angle. And then when we reach pi, right? So here our X values are then becoming more and more negative. Our Y values are then decreasing from one down to zero. When we reach pi, that's when uh, cosine reaches its minimum, right? At pi, cosine is negative one, right? That's this, that's this here, right? This x coordinate here is minus one. The y coordinate is zero. So sine of pi is zero. That's where this intersects the uh, y equals zero line, right? You keep going, right? Keep increasing the angle. And then at three pi over two, cosine is zero again, and sine is minus one. So that corresponds to this angle here, right? At angle three pi over two, right? So all the way from here to here, right? The x coordinate is now zero, right? We're back on the x equals zero line. And then the y coordinate is all the way down at this extreme here, minus one. Okay, and then we keep going around the circle until we've reached two pi, right? So at two pi, cosine is back to its maximum. At one, sine is back to zero at two pi. Right, so we're back where we started. And then we can keep increasing our angle and cosine and sine will keep going up and down forever. Right, And we can go in the other direction, do negative angles, and cosine and sine will still go up and down forever. Right, So these are periodic functions. Periodic functions. Okay, and if you scale them or shift them, you can you know change the period, you can change where these heights are, and so on, okay? But right now we're just interested in computing the derivatives. Once we know how to take the derivatives of cosine and sine, we can take the derivatives of any sort of combination, sum, product, composition, what have you. Okay, so let's do the derivatives of these. Okay, right. so their derivatives, we will show that the derivative of, let's say f of x equals sine of x, the derivative of this we'll show is gonna be actually cosine of x. And the derivative of cosine is going to be negative sine 
right? So they're not derivatives of each other. They're derivatives in each other in this way. So sine becomes cosine, cosine becomes minus sine, right? So they're kind of flipping between them. So after you take two derivatives, you'll be back, or I think four derivatives, you'll be back to where you started, okay? But, you know, it's not, it's not quite as easy as e to the x becomes e to the x, but it's, it's not so bad, okay? And so we're gonna show why this is. But if you have trouble remembering which one is minus and which one is positive, right? Think about it this way. At x equals zero, sine zero is zero, and f prime, which is cosine, is one, right? Which means sine of x is increasing at x equals zero. Oh, sorry. Sine of zero is zero, and f prime of zero, which is cosine, is one. So sine is increasing at x equals zero, right? So if you look at the sine function, you know it starts at zero, so it goes up, right? So it's increasing there. On the other hand, cosine starts at one, so it can only go down, right? So cos x uh, decreases at x equals zero, so its derivative should be minus sign, right? Um, x equals zero, right? But actually, exactly at x equals zero, it's, it's flat, but then a little bit away from it, it'll be decreasing. So that's why you have the minus sign here. So that, you know, exactly at x equals zero, it's, it's actually flat, right? Because that's where the tangent line is zero and sine of x is zero, but a little bit away from it, it'll go down, it'll start decreasing. So decreasing initially, okay? So that's kind of a quick way to remember. All right, so if you aren't interested in deriving these, then, then you can stop the video here. Otherwise, we're going to prove, you know, why these derivatives, these formulas. Okay, so let's start with sine of x. Okay, so we'll say the derivative of sine of x, right, d dx sine of x, using the limit definition of the derivative, this is limit as h goes to zero of sine of x plus h minus sine of x divided by h. Okay, and then here we're going to pull out a trick from trigonometry. So we're going to use the so-called angle addition formula from trigonometry, which says that sine of x plus h is equal to sine of x cosine of h plus cosine of x sine of h, right? So this is a way to, to change sine of two angles into some sort of product and sum of sines and cosines of different angles, x and h, x and h here. Okay, so if we plug this into our limit formula, right, so then we say d dx sine of x is then equal to the limit as h goes to zero of sine of x plus h is now this whole thing, so sine of x cosine of h plus cosine of x sine of h minus sine of x, all that divided by h, okay? And then from here, we are going to factor the sine of x's together and then we'll leave this one alone, okay? So we'll say this is limit as h goes to zero of sine of x times cosine of h minus one. So that's collecting this term and this term, right? And plus cosine of x, sine of h over h. And then this whole thing will be divided by h. Okay, and then we'll split these up and we'll note that sine of x doesn't depend on h and cosine of x doesn't depend on h. So we'll have limit as h goes to zero of sine of x times cosine of h minus one over h, 
plus limit as h goes to zero of cosine of x sine of h over h. Okay? And so sine of x doesn't depend, oops, it's blocked. Sine of x doesn't depend on h, so we can pull it out of the limit. So this gives us sine of x times the limit as h goes to zero, cosine of h minus one over h. Same thing here, cosine of x doesn't depend on h, so we can pull it out of limit. So plus cosine of x times limit as h goes to zero of sine of h over h. And here we're sort of stuck, right? We can't simplify this limit anymore without any information, right? We don't know anything about how to do this at this point or that one, right? So here we'll evaluate these limits. These limits by basically just looking at a table of values. Okay. So let me pull that up. Basically we'll have h, we'll have cosine of h minus one over h, right? And then we'll have sine of h over h, right? So we'll have a nice big table of numbers and hopefully as h goes to zero, these will approach some numbers and we can say, okay, that's what the limit is. So let me pull this table up on the book. Okay, so when h is equal to one, cosine of h minus one over h is equal to negative 0 0.45970. Okay, when h is equal to 0 0.1, cosine of h minus one over h is equal to negative 0 0.04996. When we make, h, we make h even smaller, 0 0.01, we get negative 0 0.005, 0, 0. When we make h even smaller, 0 0.001, we get negative 0 0.0005, right, and so on. So h goes to zero as we go down this table, and these values look like they're approaching zero, right? They're getting start at negative 0.4, about negative 0.5, then they go negative 0.05, negative 0.005, negative 0.0005. All right, so these approach zero. Did I spell that right? Approach. Yes, they approach zero. Okay, and then we'll do the values of this other limit, sine of h over h, right? So at h equals one, sine of h over h is 0 0.84. 147 at point 0.1. This uh, term is 0 0.99833. All right, maybe you can see where this is going already. At point 0.01, this is 0 0.99998. And at point 0 0.001, sine of h over h evaluates to 1.0000. And then there's something, you know, in a later decimal place. So these very clearly approach one, right? This one, you can tell that they're getting smaller. They're going to zero. This one, they're definitely going to one. They're, they're pretty much there when H is only at 0 0.001, right? So this is a way to evaluate those limits just kind of by hand, right? By just making a table of values. Okay. And if you're interested, there's a proof in the book that's more mathematical, but, um, you know, this is sufficient in my opinion. Okay, so now we know what the value of this limit is and this limit. So now we can, we can finish this proof, right? So now we have d d x of sine of x, right? The derivative of sine of x we said was equal to sine of x times this limit, right? Limit as h goes to zero, cosine of h minus one over h plus cosine of x times limit as h goes to zero of sine of h over h. And we just said this one approaches zero and that one approaches one. So this gives us sine of x times zero plus cosine of x times one. And we're left with cosine of x, right? The derivative of sine, okay? 
So that's what we had said before. All right, now let's prove the cosine. So let's do ddx of cosine of x. Right, so this, again, this is what we, we knew the derivative was, and now we've shown it. Sine of x has derivative cosine. So now let's do derivative of cosine, which we know to be negative sine, but we'll, we'll show it here. Right, so by the limit definition, this is h goes to zero of cosine of x plus h minus cosine of x divided by h. And in this case, we're going to use the formula, angle addition formula for cosine of a sum actually gives us cosine x cosine h minus sine of x sine of h. Okay, so we make this substitution into our limit. We get ddx of cosine of x is equal to limit as h goes to zero of cosine of x cosine of h minus sine of x sine of h. So that's just replacing this term here with this angle addition formula, right? And then we still have this minus cosine of x term. All this is divided by h, right? So we're gonna factor again. We're gonna factor the cosines together. So we get limit as h goes to zero. I'm sorry, let me, here we go. Make sure you can see that. So we have cosine of x times cosine of h minus one, right? So that's grouping this term, grouping this term and this term together, right? And factoring out the cosine and then leaving the sine term alone. So minus sine of x sine of h, all that divided by h, okay? So then if we split this up, right? We get limit as h goes to zero, cosine of x, times cosine of h minus one over h plus, sorry, minus limit as h goes to zero of sine of x times sine of h over h. Again, cosine doesn't depend on h, so we can pull it out of the limit. Cosine of x times the limit as h goes to zero of cosine of h minus one over h same thing here, right? Sine doesn't depend on h, so we can pull sine of x out. So we get sine of x times limit as h goes to zero of sine of h over h, right? And then we're left with something very similar as we had when we're taking the derivative of sine. We have these two limits sitting right there, cosine of h minus one over h and sine of h over h. This one approached zero and that one approached one. Right, so we already said that what those limits were. So this gives us cosine of x times zero minus sine of x times one, which gives us, you know, just sine minus sine of x, right? Which we knew, we already said that that was the derivative, right? Derivative of cosine is equal to minus sine of x, okay? And then that's, how we would show that these derivatives are actually these simple formulas, okay?